good day, good afternoon for those of you in, uh, in, uh, on the East Coast. I'm Seth Cropsey, uh, Director of Hudson Institute's Center for American Sea Power. And the subject of today's discussion is the current administration's trade policy toward Asia, where 60% of the world's population live and with which the United States has traded since uh, really decades before uh, Commodore Perry sailed to Japan in the mid 19th century. US trade policy is important because the US is a commercial republic with a large interest in preserving a rules-based trade system whose transparency is a fundamental World Trade Organization aim. Successful US trade policy today, as it did in the mid 19th century, aims to encourage worldwide investment and in trade as it seeks to uphold trading partners' commitments. The issue of US trade policy has been with us since the administration of George Washington. In, in a long report to the House of Representatives written in 1793, shortly before his resignation, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson urged reprisals against Britain for what he claimed was an unfair control of transatlantic merchant shipping as well as keeping American cargo ships out of British West Indies ports. Secretary, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, th through a third party, argued back that it would be wildly imprudent uh, to upset trade relations with the young United States' largest trading partner. The argument over national trade policy did not end with the commercial treaty between the US and Britain that gave each uh, most favored nation trading status. That is the lowest duties on goods that each nation traded with each other. It continues today. For a nation, the United States, whose business is business, trade policy is deeply important. So with us today um, is a very impressive panel. Uh, and uh, uh, I will mention briefly their bios because an exhaustive discussion would take up more time than we have. Kevin Hassett is distinguished visiting fellow at Hoover Institution and former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. Ashley Tellis, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs. Thomas Dusterberg is a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. Riley Walters is chairman, deputy director uh, at Hudson Institute for Japan. Um, the questions I'm going to ask each panelist are uh, for Mr. Hassett, does US trade policy matter? And if so, why? Should a whole of government approach to competition between the US and China include trade policy and why? Where does Taiwan fit into US trade policy? For Mr. Dusterberg, what is Biden's, President Biden's trade policy to Asia? Why is it important that the US have one? Does history provide any useful examples of the value of having a trade policy or of not having one? 
what place in U.S. trade policy should our trade policy with Taiwan hold and why? For Mr. Tellus, what does U.S. trade policy mean for Southeast Asia and India? What could an effective one accomplish? Does the U.S. have an effective one? Do you have recommendations for U.S. trade policy for Asia as a whole? And for Mr. Walters, have U.S. trade policies toward Japan made a difference in the past? Does the U.S. currently have a trade policy for Japan? What would U.S. objectives be? What should and what could be an effective trade policy? The same question about Taiwan. What should our trade policy be? And what, how would it work? So I'd like to turn the floor over uh, to, uh, to Thomas Dusterberg and we'll, uh, we'll proceed from there, Tom. Okay, thanks Seth. It's nice to be with you and uh, with this uh, exceptional panel that you've assembled. I'm gonna start out um, with your, uh, uh, following up on your question about uh, historical examples, since you started off in the uh, 18th century, there are a couple in the 19th century that are um, uh, relevant, I think. Uh, one thinks of the uh, first in uh, Germany, what became Germany in the 19th century, uh, starting about 1834, they put in a customs union called the Zollverein. And that was one of the first steps in the unification of Germany and the rationalization of the German economy, which became uh, one of the uh, leading economies of the world in, uh, by the end of the 19th century. Uh, the British Industrial Revolution was um, um, uh, aided and um, strengthened by the passage uh, or the repeal of what were called corn laws, which were protectionist measures uh, to protect the agriculture industry in uh, Britain. And uh, Britain was the rising manufacturing power uh, at that time. And its, its rise as the dominant manufacturing power, at least in the 19th century, was, uh, was firmly aided by uh, th that trade policy decision. Now, in the United States, the one I like uh, the best is the... Uh, uh, Coming out of the 1930s and, and World War II, a uh, collection of fairly visionary, I think, leaders in, in the United States put together what became the global trading system that has uh, led to unprecedented prosperity in the 21st century. But the context of that um, uh, decision to put in place uh, what became the, the, the World Trade Organization later and the international financial institutions was coming out of the uh, Great Recession, Great Depression and World War II, uh, a good chunk of the world, including Europe and uh, Japan were totally devastated. And the Soviet Union was a victor in that. And it was clear that it had become the enemy of the United States and, or the, the rival, let's put it that way, of the United States. So the more or less free trade policy, which was put into place in the 1940s and elaborated in the 1950s and after that, uh, was designed especially with foreign policy objectives, namely to um, um, counter growing Russian Soviet influence uh, throughout the world by strengthening uh, the economies of the defeated in World War II, uh, Germany, Japan, but also um, the rest of Europe. And indeed, um, US policymakers subsumed, if you will, uh, some US economic interests to the uh, task uh, of strengthening especially the European economy, and put into place a number of uh, concessions uh, for uh, especially the Europeans uh, that have led over the course of the last 50 or 60 years, but more importantly, in the last 20 or 30, to a number of irritants in, in the relationship uh, between our countries. But nonetheless, it was a successful policy. Uh, prosperity uh, was, was reintroduced, especially into Europe, 
the Soviet advance was stopped and eventually the uh, Soviet empire imploded in large part because of the uh, inability to keep up economically with the West. Now, does um, the current administration have a firm trade policy? I think the answer is no, not yet. Um, this administration is uh, uniquely uh, uh, concerned with and expending its political uh, capital on things other than trade policy. It wants to uh, first um, get its uh, domestic agenda through the Congress. Um, and uh, this includes uh, not only an infrastructure bill, but a uh, uh, historical increase in the social welfare state in, in, in the United States. Uh, but it also wants to address the looming issue uh, perhaps looming is not no longer the word we should use of, of climate change. And so the uh, concern with and uh, uh, attention to those issues, which are this week, especially, uh, especially at the forefront of their thinking, I think has led to uh, a conscious decision not to move forward on trade policy, which in any case is, is more or less controversial. But in as much as what one can uh, uh, untangle some threads of what they are thinking, um, I think uh, it, it's, it's fair to say that we, we can already see that uh, reaching out to uh, Europe uh, and trying to repair relations with Europe in preparation for uh, hopefully uh, having something approaching uh, a united approach to the challenge of Chinese mercantilism um, and the uh, reinvigoration of the world trading system uh, is, is pretty evident. There have been a number of concessions that the United States has already made with uh, the Europeans, such as the uh, ending the Airbus uh, uh, commercial aviation dispute on terms very favorable to the Europeans. Um, just uh, over the weekend, um, they settled or put a framework in place to settle the uh, steel aluminum tariff disputes uh, with the Europeans. Um, another strand of their thinking uh, was, has been articulated by the National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan in a series of articles and subsequent speeches since he came into power to have an America first, uh, worker first uh, trade policy. Uh, so I think that will have to be articulated. It's very complicated in terms of uh, uh, moving forward on something approaching a more aggressive open trade agenda and articulating to the world the need for more uh, free trade, especially when you're talking with uh, a peer competitor like China. Uh, this worker first, um, US first, America first agenda uh, is, is going to be something of an issue, but we can talk about that later. Uh, partly in response to what the United States is doing, um, our European friends are also engaged in thinking about creating national champions in high technology industries. Uh, they're putting money on the table. The Japanese are, uh, hopefully Riley will address this a little bit. The Japanese are uh, at least talking about uh, creating and uh, supporting their own national champions. Um, so I think those are the main thrusts of, of where uh, the current administration is thinking. What should they be doing? Um, and here I'm, I'm sure that Ashley and uh, um, Riley are gonna uh, focus in on this, but uh, more attention to East Asia is clearly uh, a priority. The world is uh, looking for US leadership um, on how to uh, work with China in a way that uh, doesn't allow them to um, export their, uh, what I've called a mercantilist trade policy, uh, which has political implications as well throughout the world. Um, so what does this mean? Um, I would argue for, um, despite the, um, you know, there are clear costs to rejoining what was called the Trade Trans-Pacific Partnership, now called the Comprehensive and uh, 
progressive trade partnership uh, and comprehensive trade Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. Uh, there are costs to that to the manufacturing center, but I think they pale in comparison with the, uh, the costs of not doing it, which we're seeing every day, which is China is aggressively trying to organize a great Chinese co-prosperity sphere in Asia. And um, some of the, the countries uh, that we would like to have support us the Pacific Rim, Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, I think are uh, uh, wondering whether or not we're gonna step into a leadership position. So there's that. Uh, you mentioned Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is of course is vitally important to the United States economy, uh, not the least of which is for its uh, uh, leadership in the advanced uh, semiconductor production era. Um, United States has lost uh, a step or two in its leadership in the world, at least in the ability to fabricate semiconductors in Taiwan uh, through uh, massive investments and um, uh, has, has stepped into the role of being the leading semiconductor producer. So it's in the, um, uh, the sites of uh, Xi Jinping for eventual incorporation into China as, as a fundamental Chinese goal. Um, we need to uh, work with them to make sure that that um, doesn't happen. Um, uh, allowing uh, uh, Taiwan into the CPTPP, which hopefully we will rejoin, would be one step. Uh, I would support a free trade agreement with, with Taiwan. Um, and I'll just close with uh, something I hope our other panelists focus on which is the need, I think, to reach out more aggressively to Southeast Asian nations. These, uh, the ASEAN grouping is uh, the youngest uh, uh, demographic in the world. It's fast growing. It's something like either the fifth or the fourth largest economic conglomeration in the world. Um, they're not particularly, um, uh, um, uh, for historical reasons, uh, wanting to be under the shadow of, of China, but we need to be more aggressive in working with them. Uh, and so again, there joining the TPP again would be one step in that direction. So let me let me stop there and look forward to the, the back and forth with our uh, other colleagues. Thank you, Tom. Uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting, and I. I... I, there will be questions. I'll have some questions, but let's let's move on to Ashley. Uh, Ashley, okay. you've got the floor. Well, thank you, Seth, and it's great to be here with both Tom and Riley. Uh, let me start by uh, advancing a simple proposition, which may sound controversial, but is certainly not controversial to my mind. We are obviously now in the depths of great power competition with China after 30 years of uh, hoping that we would not come to this pass, uh, we finally find ourselves uh, in the midst of very serious uh, geopolitical and geostrategic competition with China. Even as we find ourselves in the midst of this competition, we have to be aware of the reality that we are also economically interdependent with China, which leads me to the conclusion uh, that the first rule about security competition under conditions of interdependence must be to accept the proposition that trading with others is critical to increase US prosperity and competitiveness. And increased US prosperity and competitiveness in turn is critical for US success in the military competition with China. So this is the paradox that just as we are engaged in military competition with China, we cannot afford uh, to turn our backs on the rest of the world, including China, if we have to stand a good chance of competing with China. To my mind, what this means in terms of policy is that we ought to be working vigorously uh, 
to universally reduce trade barriers so that our integration with the global economic system may be even deeper in order that we can derive the gains from trade. And we should focus on restricting trade primarily in the realm of advanced defense goods and their components to China. So in other words, I think a, a future trade policy should focus on the universal reduction of trade barriers, preferably through the WTO, because that creates the largest playing field globally. While we restrict trade in very narrow areas, which is primarily defense goods and components uh, with respect to China. Now, of course, as we do this, we ought to be making the requisite domestic investments in innovation and adjustment programs. And I think what President Biden is trying to do is certainly the latter. He's certainly focused on investing in adjustment programs broadly understood to support the working class and the laboring classes and so on and so forth. And that's all fine. But if that is done to the exclusion of the expansion of the global trading system, and in particular, America's involvement in the global trading system, then we really lose half of the equation that makes us competitive with the Chinese. So even as we focus on you know, getting things right at home, we need to think very seriously about how we deepen our engagement with the trading system abroad, because that's really the key to increasing our prosperity, to increasing our wealth, to increasing our competitiveness, and all those elements then enable us to compete with the Chinese. So missing out on the trade part actually handicaps us in the competition with China. And that's something that you know, we ought to be very concerned about. And whatever the reasons for the administration's diffidence, and I would like to hear Tom uh, you know, speak on those reasons uh, in, the, in the discussion period, we need to recognize that that diffidence actually undermines our capacity uh, to cope uh, with the Chinese. And I wanna say a few words about India in this context because the administration has made uh, it one of its key planks of competing with China, building a new relationship with India. And in many ways, I think this is a sensible strategy. It's sensible in part because the Indians too, after many years of trying to manage their own relationship with China have ended up in very serious security competition with Beijing. So we are at that point where India has rivalries with China at about the same time that the US rivalry with China is intensifying, which means that we are well made for each other as strategic partners because we do have a common adversary. And we have made gains in building the US-India partnership in the strategic space to cope with China. But the irony and the tragedy is that even as we are coming closer in geopolitical terms with India in our competition with China or in our mutual competition with China, our economic partnership with India has, has flagged. And it's flagged in part because India has adopted in recent years a set of policies that really suggest a discomfort with external trade openness. And in many ways, uh, the Trump administration's own rhetoric about autarky and uh, an inward looking economic policy legitimized many of the government of India's own economic policies in recent years, which have been more and more anti-trade. So the emphasis on increasing tariffs, however justified in the short run uh, for purposes of raising state revenues, essentially makes it harder for India to compete uh, with other partners in the global trading system. The emphasis on manufacturing localization, 
the emphasis on increasing exports while minimizing imports, uh, the weaknesses of intellectual uh, property protections. And like China, the increasing desire to build Indian national champions, especially in the digital space, all reflect an obsession with self-reliance, which at the end of the day will not deliver. So we have 50 years of India's economic experience from 1950 to about 1980, which showed us that India's desire for economic reliance did not yield enhanced economic growth and actually destroyed its competitiveness for China. And so uh, if India goes in this direction, as it attempted to during the Trump years, almost without intending to emulating Trump's policies, India would actually become less competitive with China at a time when China is a serious threat both to Indian security and to US security. And so I think there are two huge pieces of unfinished business as far as I'm concerned. The first huge piece of unfinished business is that the Biden administration needs to lay out a positive agenda for trade, including deepened integration with broadly the Indo-Pacific economic space. And the second big piece of unfinished business is that the US-India relationship which has demonstrated great gains in the strategic space uh, since the time President George W. Bush was in office, now needs to up the game in the economic space so that the United States and India do not just remain strategic partners vis-a-vis -vis China, but increasingly exploit their economic complementarities to provide gains for both parties. And this requires to my mind, I think, two uh, policy shifts that are essential. The first policy shift at the US end must be for the United States to seriously consider rejoining the TPP. And I would argue, even go back to resuscitating the discussions about the TTIP with our European partners. Uh, in the same, uh, as part of that same process, uh, we need to uh, think seriously about uh, reconceiving our trade relationship with India. So far, most of our discussions about trade with India have been about market access for a handful of issues that have bedeviled us, including in agriculture, medical goods, so on and so forth. Uh, India in turn has had a handful of complaints about the United States, primarily with respect to access for Indian labor to the US market, the whole question of H-1Bs, which allow trained Indian, uh, trained Indian professionals to come and work uh, in the United States. India has been miffed about the Trump administration's decision to pull India from enjoying uh, GSP preferences, which is essentially tariff-free uh, uh, exports to the United States. And there has been a long-standing beef about social security totalization. That is uh, Indian professionals who contribute to social security and are unable to recoup uh, those contributions in their home countries. So there've been a series of issues that have bedeviled the US-India trade relationship in recent years. But I think uh, getting uh, trapped in just these discrete issues misses the larger picture, which is that the United States and India need to think very boldly about greater trade engagement in order to deepen their economic interdependence so that the gains from trade can be shared by both partners, particularly in the context of competition with China. So that is, that is one big basket. The second big issue that I think we need to think about is whether India is willing to make the kinds of domestic reforms and in particular trade reforms that would allow it to reconceive the possibility of engaging with a, in a free trade agreement with the United States over time. Obviously, India is not ready uh, for a free trade agreement today, no matter what the advertising says. 
But the question that we ought to ask ourselves is should we at least set that up as an ambition uh, that we have something that we can work towards over the next decade or so? Because a strategic partnership where the United States and India are simply joined at the hip on geopolitical matters, but has weak economic foundations is not going to allow either India or the United States uh, to gain the full benefits of the partnership that are required in order to successfully compete with China. So there's enough to be done at both the Washington end and the New Delhi end if we are to compete with the challenges posed by Beijing. Let me end, let me end there, Seth. Happy to talk about things that I may have excluded. We will, we will Ashley, and thank you very much. Uh, so perceptive analysis and uh, an important one, and I look forward to our discussion following. Uh, Kev, you, you know that you've got the questions that I asked you. Mm -hmm. So if you would, uh, if you would address those, then we'll go to Riley, and I think we'll be able to have time for a discussion. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think that, uh, the biggest question that you have is like first, uh, like like does U.S. trade policy matter? Uh, and you know, I, obviously it does, uh, but uh, you know how how does it matter? And and you know, I, I think that historically, uh, the way I think about U.S. trade policy is that you know, go back to sort of the days when the Soviet Union was there, uh, that the U.S. had an umbrella, the Soviet Union had an umbrella. And we were competing to get countries to sort of live under our umbrellas. Uh, and one of the ways that the US uh, did that effectively was it gave countries access uh, to our market, the you know, biggest, wealthiest market in the world, you know, pretty much without a lot of questions asked. So, so we have a whole lot of bilateral trade treaties that are pretty one-sided where uh, you know, the US is wide open um, but the countries that, you know, we're allowing into our country are pretty much closed uh, to our products. You know, I, I can remember there was an example of this during the Bush administration. You remember the Columbia free trade deal where, where basically, which was hard to get through Congress, where you know, we had already eliminated all our tariffs on Colombian goods. But and so the Colombia free trade deal was them agreeing uh, to eliminate tariffs on, on our goods. And, and, and so, so that one sidedness is something that's really hard to fix. And you know, President Trump's view was, yeah, I'm just gonna like slap tariffs on people and then negotiate with them. And sure, I wanna have like, you know, free trade, uh, zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers. That's the you know, best case. But if they're gonna screw with us, then I'm gonna screw with them basically. And I think that that sort of brinksmanship that he brought to trade policy uh, was effective. Uh, in fact, in my new book that just came out, it's coming out tomorrow, The Drift, um, uh, I, I talk a lot about, I have a whole chapter on White House trade policy. And I think that what happened was that when Trump showed that he was serious, especially for big developed countries that have more or less closed their markets to us, uh, then they came to the table and we got like the Korean free trade deal, which improved a lot, a lot of stuff. And so I think that trade policy matters uh, because you know free trade is good, but trade policy for the US especially matters because there's like these legacy deals that are really harmful uh, to the US. Um, your ne next question is, should a, should a whole of government approach to competition between the US and China include trade policy? You know, I, I think that trade policy was really the center of the Trump administration's China policy really. And um, it, it, it really had an effect, I suppose, but it just kind of scratched the surface of, of the problem. You know, when I ran the Council of Economic Advisors, you know, we did a, a careful study of like IP theft um, by China of US firms uh, and, you know, found that basically, you know, we're losing hundreds of billions a year in IP to the Chinese. You know, it's, it's just like, you know, Barbary piracy, <laughs> but you know, over the internet, uh, and and I think that standing up to China because there's they're basically you know stealing our lunch is something that has to be done, um, and I also think that when you do that, then you attack um, or undermine Chinese economic growth, which you know, Seth, you you would tell me has has geopolitical uh, implications. You know that they have less money to. 
spend on, on weapons and might be less likely to be adventurous. Uh, and so uh, where does Taiwan fit into US trade policy? I think Taiwan is uh, you know, a crucial trading partner uh, really for the whole world. Uh, and um, you know, if Taiwan were to stop producing uh, uh, chips uh, because of some adventurism by China and Taiwan, uh, then it'd be catastrophic for the global economy. We'd have a, a global economic recession. Uh, and so I think that, you know, making it clear that the U.S. would stand by Taiwan, which I guess uh, uh, President Biden maybe did a little bit uh, inappropriately <laughs> recently, but I think that, that it's essential uh, for the future of the, of the global economy that, that China know that our policy is, if they continue to steal our IP, then we're going to whack the heck out of them with tariffs. And if they do something to Taiwan, we're going to stand with them. Um, I think the, the current administration's trade policy is a work in progress. Uh, I, and I think that they're, they're kind of uh, reluctant to undo a lot of the tariffs that Trump put in place. Uh, but I haven't really seen um, much of a trade policy um, outline. Uh, in fact, uh, I uh, you know hear through the grapevine that the career staff over at USTR feel kind of sidelined. Um, and so much like much else in the Biden administration, it kind of feels to me like their trade policy is, is non-existent. It's just, uh, you know, there's no process, uh, there's no real, real policy uh, going forward right now. And of course, the big risk uh, from that, which I'll finish with, Seth, is that, that we really need a strong trade policy with China because it's the only thing that's going to stop them from, from really like stealing a blind. Um, which I'm sure uh, those activities have ramped up since Trump left office. Kevin, thank you. We'll, uh, um, we'll have time for a discussion afterwards, uh, but thank you for the remarks, very helpful. Okay, so Riley, floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, thanks for having me, uh, Seth. You know, I, I think this event is, um, super timely. Uh, you know, our, our U.S. trade representative will be going to Asia in just a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll have a little bit more details on what kind of trade policy the Biden administration is thinking about, since that kind of be, that, that tends to be, I think, an underlying theme of this, this event today is, what is it? <laughs> um, you asked me to speak about, uh, you know, our, our trade history with Japan and Taiwan. And, um, you know, we have a a long and robust history with these two economies. Um, you know, for for decades, they they currently are our fourth and ninth largest trading partners, but it's they've really been that for the past few decades. I mean, the the negotiations, the history, uh, you know, the the change in sentiment toward these partners has really shifted. Um, you know, I think. Uh, we talk about U.S.-China competition these days, but you can really just go back a few decades, and it was there was a similar sentiment, I think, with with Japan. You know, in the uh, in the '80s, you know, we had this uh, we had this uh, competition over semiconductor production with Japan, and we had to come to an agreement on that. We also had uh, currency issues. Uh, you know, I would say. If I had to characterize our, our trade relationship with Japan, it, it's really shifted from, from an economic competitor to today where it's more of a strategic partner, or at least I think we see it that way. Um, you know, the evolution over each decade has been unique. In the 90s, it was negotiating uh, the World Trade Organization with Japan and what, uh, with, uh, what was formerly the, the formal quad. You know, we talk about the quadrilateral, quadrilateral strategic dialogue these days of the United States Australia, Japan, and, and India, the, the original quad was the US, EU, Canada, and Japan on trade. Um, and then in the, the 2000s, the early 2000s, you know, it was all about beef, essentially. It was, uh, you know, uh, beef trade was a big issue with Japan and Taiwan, uh, and still lingers this day, actually, with, with Taiwan a little bit. And I'll, I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And then if I just had to sort of characterize the, uh, the 2010s, it was all about CPTPP, or I guess formally the Trans-Pacific Partnership and negotiating that. Uh, up until most recently, of course, when the Trump administration came in, uh, they decided to leave the negotiations 
uh, as, as Kevin was saying, you know, the, the trade negotiation uh, strategy was a lot more aggressive, I think, than uh, his predecessors. You know, there were the threat of Section 232 tariffs on Japanese automobiles, uh, you know, uh, arguing that perhaps Japanese automobile imports were a threat to U.S. national security. And so the, the U.S.-Japan, I think, trade negotiation over the last five years was pretty chaotic, but not necessarily bad. Um, we did end up negotiating U.S.-Japan trade agreement and a U.S.-Japan digital agreement. Uh, the problem it's not really a problem, but uh, the efficacy of those deals is questionable just because they went into effect January of 2020. And so on you know, February and March of 2020, the, the world basically started to basically shut down because of COVID. So it's really hard to actually measure the effect, the effectiveness of these, of these deals. Uh, but uh, you know, good nonetheless, and the fact that, that we have them on the books. Uh, and you know the Trump administration also worked with Japan and the EU on uh, towards WTO negotiations. Um, you know, coming up with new rules around industrial standards, of course, with a with an eye toward China and and how their state owned enterprises are, are are potentially affecting not just China's economy but competition uh, in the region and elsewhere. Um, what's going on now, I think, with U.S. Japan trade negotiations is, you know, a lot of the focus is still on COVID. I think world trade as a whole is, has generally, is generally recovering this year. Um, so we'll see, I think a lot of things sort of return back to normal. Obviously we have some outlying issues. Um, bottlenecking is always an issue at, at our ports. Um, but uh, outside of that, you know, uh, things are, are generally returning back to normal. And, uh, you know, the U.S., I think if I had to characterize the last year of U.S.-Japan trade negotiations, well, there really hasn't been much. Um, you know, it was first the Biden administration was coming into office. So, you know, we kind of give them a, a break on setting up their own priorities. And then the Japanese actually just finished their own elections um, with Kishida and, and his party uh, maintaining a, a single majority within the lower house. And so, now, maybe we can actually start moving forward on some good trade uh, negotiations, figuring that out, uh, what that actually is. And I think it's already been echoed here. It's, you know, it, it, what can the United States do in the region? Um, you know, the Japanese, as much as they know that the U.S. isn't coming back to the CPTPP or the, the formal Trans-Pacific Partnership, still wants the U.S. to join. Even though the U.S. and Japan have this trade agreement, uh, even though they know that you know it's it's not just an issue with the White House, it's an issue with Congress and this this increasingly negative sentiment toward trade uh, within the United States, um, they still have hopes that one day the United States can join. Um, and but all that being said, Japan hasn't sort of given up. I think Japan has, during the Trump administration, figured it needs to actually become the leader of trade in the Asia Pacific. Um, they didn't just finish the, the TPP, the CPTPP. Uh, they also negotiated an economic partnership agreement with the European Union. They, uh, they negotiated, they joined with China, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, and they're welcoming new members into the CPTPP. Um, and so I think they've found it upon themselves that you know, if the United States isn't leading in the region, someone's going to have to. And I think it was certainly under former Prime Minister Abe, he sort of he took that initiative under, under himself to, uh, to lead in this issue. Uh, going forward um, uh, on, on US-Japan, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion, I think, again, sort of echoing uh, my, my co-panelists here, it's, it, there's a lot of emphasis on climate change, uh, building economic resiliency, I don't, I don't believe the United States and Japan currently have the same view on what that means. I think for Japan, uh, diversif diversification is actually what's important in building this resiliency. Um, not just you know, creating stronger relations with the EU or the US, there's a big focus on Southeast Asia. Uh, and so, you know, again, I, I, I echo what Tom was saying, um, that there needs to be more engagement with Southeast Asia because everyone is looking at Southeast Asia, uh, and rightly so. It, it is an emerging market. Uh, 
um, you know, I think Vietnam is, is going to be the next big place uh, for, uh, you know, a lot of this competition. You know, the South Koreans have already invested heavily there. The Japanese have heavily invested there. The Taiwanese are there. Everyone's essentially there um, because it's the next emerging market, I think. Um, anyways, uh, to, to come back to that, come back to U.S. Japan in just a minute and sort of the Biden team's trade uh, policies. I want to talk about Taiwan real quick, too, because uh, Taiwan is is uh, an important uh, trading partner, I, I, as, as already highlighted. And again, we have a strong trade history with them, uh, negotiation wise. You know, we've we've been we've had a trade and investment framework agreement or TIFA with Taiwan for uh, nearly 30 years now. Um, it was negotiated back in 1994 before the WTO, uh, and it's really the the main platform for U.S.-Taiwan trade negotiations. Um, now, we didn't have a TIFA throughout the Trump administration, and the Biden administration just had their first TIFA uh, earlier this summer, which is really great. Um, uh, but again, you know, I think uh, sort of maybe what Kevin was getting at, there was, there's been some long time sentiment around getting issues resolved between the U.S. and Taiwan, but I think a lot of the, the, the structure is there to keep moving forward now. I think the Taiwanese certainly are, are really willing to engage more. I think the US is willing to engage more in Taiwan as well, even though I think a lot of the, the Taiwan analysts these days are probably a little bit more strategically focused than, than economically focused. Uh, but nonetheless, it's good that the attention, that Taiwan is getting the, the attention that it deserves. Um, other sort of just one other platform, um, you know, because I think the TIFA dialogues were stalled, I think it, that was, that's usually covered under USTR. Uh, I think the State Department felt unto itself to expand the economic dialogue with Taiwan into what's called our economic prosperity partnership dialogue. Um, that it, I think one thing I haven't really gotten to, um, but I wanna highlight is US trade policy always, isn't always just about trade. Uh, and it's not just in, within the confines of the U.S. Trade Representative's office. Uh, you know, it involves the Department of Commerce. It involves other agencies. Uh, it's it really is becoming more of an all of government effort, which <laughs> makes things more difficult sometimes because getting all of government to work uh, toward a single issue can be can be quite difficult. Uh, but that. All that goes to say is, you know, I think the Trump administration, or sorry, um, the Biden administration's trade policy is uh, unique. Um, right now, it definitely seems to be mostly focused on repairing a lot of the relationships in Asia and within Europe. Uh, but the, I think the question then is, what what's next? Um, what actually comes after that? I mean, it's great that we can sort of uh, begin talking again with our, our partners and allies. Um, but really what comes after that. And I don't know if the Biden administration, from what we've sort of seen so far in their Build Back Better initiative can really be uh, evolved into something of a leadership role. Um, if, if, if they wanna take a leadership role in something like climate change, that's great. You know, how do we, how do we get other, uh, our partners and allies to invest in their infrastructure? How do we, increase their demand for uh, energy diversification? Um, you know, what does that mean for the United States? How do we sort of lead on, uh, you know, uh, technical and, and uh, um, building labor and, 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 and technical abilities in Southeast Asia? Uh, but beyond that, you know, it, it's a real question of what is, what is the Biden administration going to do? And I think since we've heard that China and Taiwan want to join, uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, I think there's been an even greater call for the Biden administration to act. And there's some good recommendations out there. I think the number one for Taiwan is just a free trade agreement with Taiwan. You know, they are probably the most at risk at, at their, with their economic dependence on China. And so increasing their diversification away from China, I think is the most important. Uh, beyond that, you know, a digital trade agreement is worthwhile. I think there's a lot of focus on digital trade these days. One because it's it's sort of easy pickings. You know, it's it it doesn't have as much of a I think negative sentiment around manufacturing and the implication that has for jobs and uh, 
uh, it's really forward looking, right? So as we as we sort of move into our digital economy and everyone relies more on digital infrastructure, uh, you know, getting the standards set and making sure that it's the US and those who share our values uh, to set the standard now, uh, whether rather than sort of joining later uh, is definitely important. So uh, all that goes to say, you know, is um, I, I hope that the Biden administration can come up with a more concrete trade policy. Um, but, you know, I think what they're doing right now isn't so bad. Uh, certainly, you know, making sure our relationships are there is important. But, you know, eventually there's going to be a point where we're going to need a little bit more than that. So thank you. Thank you, Riley. Uh, I'd like to throw the floor open for discussion among the panelists, but I have a question for all of you first. And, uh, and that is, uh, has the, over the past, oh, I don't know, let's say 20 years or so, has the, uh, has the, the climate, the political climate on trade changed significantly? at least in Congress, or if, if you can expand beyond Congress, but Congress matters a great deal here. Is, is, as, uh, do we still, as, as, a, as a country, um, have the same attachment to free trade, for example, or expanding trade that we did um, you know, in former years, 20, 30, 40 years ago? I think I, I was gonna. Sorry, Tom. If you want to go first, <laughs> well, we might say, say. I'll just say something really quickly, yeah. which is that uh, that I think that when China entered the WTO, um, that you know, there's this massive economic literature, uh, you know, authors Otter and Schott and others uh, that shows that uh, you know, basically China came in. Uh, and factories like all over America shut down. Um, the, it actually turns out that, that before China entered the WTO, there was always this risk if we didn't give them a favored nation status that there'd be the smooth holly tariffs would go back in place. And so there's actually cross-section variation about like what parts of the country were protected uh, by the old system with China. Uh, and so that allows them to identify the effect of removing that protection by putting them in the WTO. And basically the places that were previously protected against trade with China that they were then opened up are places where, you know, suicides went up, drug dependency went up, divorce went up, uh, incomes went down, unemployment stayed high forever. Uh, and I think that the wave of support for the anti-trade people Really, it was starting to be palpable with, when I was advising McCain when he was running for president. Everywhere you went, people are like, oh, China's killing us. Uh, but I think that it, that shock, uh, which has very well documented academic negative effects on big pockets of the country, has fundamentally altered Americans' relationship with, with trade. Kevin? Yeah, I can't add too much to that. I mean, it's clearly deteriorated. Uh, it's not just China, I think. Um, let me just focus on one thing, the, the World Trade Organization. It was a fundamental mistake uh, back in 1995 to call it the World Trade Organization, at least in the context of American politics. Um, it has not functioned very well. It, it, it's not been good at uh, adjudicating disputes um, and it's become uh, an object of distrust uh, by both policymakers, I think, um, because things like the, the, the um, Airbus case, which I mentioned earlier, just can't get solved. It can't get solved in a, a way that appears to be uh, balanced. But there's also a deeper, I, I think, problem, which is uh, people are distrustful of, uh, at least in the United States, you know, uh, they're distrustful of, of governing elites in general. And this is the archetypal you know, global organization that is um, starting to you know, uh, direct policy in the United States without um, you know, proper support from either the pop populace or the, the, the Congress. So uh, as the concern with climate change comes in and 
people are starting to lean on the uh, the trade apparatus to be a part of the um, uh, the battle against uh, climate change. I think that sentiment, uh, that populist sentiment, if you will, that anti-elite sentiment will further undermine um, the the uh, what used to be something of a consensus that uh, trade was a good thing for the for the U.S. economy. So it needs work. I mean, it it needs to be articulated in a much better, more complete way. Uh, you know, the geo geopolitical discussion we've had about China, about East Asia, uh, is part of that. But it just needs to be articulated a lot better than it has. I've um, there's been polls over the past few years about you know showing sentiment toward free trade and. Um, it's still generally positive. I think, you know, the, the effect that Kevin was talking about um, during the, the early 2000s, that, that was certainly there. But I think a lot of that's effect, effectively, I mean, it still lingers, obviously, in certain pockets of the United States, but as an aggregate, it's not really there as much as it was anymore. Um, you know, and it's, it's hard to say that that'll ever happen again, really. Um, you know, it's, China was, you know, it, it is the world's largest economy uh, by by population. And so, you know, to, to see that effect happen again, you know, maybe if India opens up <laughs> again, you might see something similar. But, uh, you know, besides that, it's if we're talking about Taiwan or Japan or even just the members of CPTPP, it's it's questionable whether it really have that that of an effect on the US economy, if anything. You know there are estimates that show it, it'll be a positive effect. Um, so it really depends, I think, on who we're talking about uh, having a, a new trade relationship with. And it comes down to messaging within Congress. Now, I think within within Congress, the sentiment is increasingly negative uh, because, you know, uh, as much as we would hope, uh, I don't think as many trade experts exist in in Washington as they're used to. And so most of it comes down to sentiment, whether you like the country or not, about whether we should have trade with them. And so, um, yeah, messaging, I think, will be increasingly important on a lot of these issues. Thank you, Riley. Ashley, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make two points. I think it's quite clear that China's entry into the WTO, you know, imposed costs, particularly on some sections of American society disproportionately. Uh, so the question then becomes, you know, does one throw the baby out of the bathwater and sort of jettison uh, an open trading system itself? And to my mind, I don't think that's the answer. We did actually a very interesting study in the run-up to the elections was called Foreign Policy for the Middle Class. And, you know, it's the Biden administration has run with that study. And in, we looked in particular at uh, Colorado, Nebraska, and Ohio, you know, states that were affected uh, in, in, in part by China's entry into the WTO. And we found that there was still a broad sentiment in support of open trade, but there were two things that we need to do in order to sort of maintain the open trade consensus. First is we have to penalize the Chinese when there are very clear cut violations you know, of the trading system. That is, you don't give the Chinese a pass uh, when there are clear violations. And two, you have to sort of create safety nets uh, that will help affected populations adjust to the realities of trade. Because my view is trade is always going to cause dislocations, right? I mean, uh, we had manufacturing dislocations because of China. But tomorrow we'll have other kinds of dislocations as we integrate into the global system. It could be agriculture, it could be services. So the question then becomes, how do you protect the consensus? And I think you protect the consensus by making certain that there are rules that are uniformly applied to all so that people can't game the system. And two, you have to have transient protections for those who are affected uh, you know, by the changes. And I think if we can do both those, uh, we can sort of, you know, fight the sentiment, which I agree with all the co-panelists has certainly turned anti-trade in recent years. Ashley, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the members of the panel. Is it, uh, 
uh, exceptionally interesting discussion today. I'm sorry that we don't have more time, but um, I hope that uh, we may be able to reconvene in the not too distant future uh, and continue the subject as as um, as I as one of you mentioned. I think it was uh, Tom. Um, the uh, the connection between uh, between trade policy or maybe it was Ashley, I forget. <laughs> the connection between trade policy <clears throat> and wealth is, uh, <clears throat> is inextricable. And the connection between wealth and uh, an effective and powerful military is something that you can go back to Adam Smith if you, if you need a more expert uh, opinion on the same subject. So on that note, uh, <clears throat> again, I'd like to thank you all for a, a wonderful conversation and, uh, and uh, bid you all goodbye as well as our viewers and uh, see you next time. Take care all. Thank Thanks, Seth.